It's 1450 KMMS 1340 KPRK. Good morning and welcome to your Wednesday. My name is Chris Griffin and it is my distinct honor and pleasure to welcome back into the studio MSU physicist Nico Humes. Welcome back, Nico. Thank you, thank you. I didn't have the crowd noises for you this week. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> I want a trumpet. Like a king. <laughs> you know what? I'll find the sound effect for you. I think, I think today we're going to talk about the, f- the physics of North American football. Yes, that's right. North American football. Yes, because I know that you are a soccer fan or a football fan. I'm Argentinian. We're all soccer fans. I mean, football fans. I mean, non-North American football fans. Where where do you want to start? Because it seems that everything that happens on the field happens because of physics. Everything happens uh, because of physics. Every, like it, It is what makes the world go round and the ball goes piratey. So I, I think we should talk about maybe maybe one of the biggest misconceptions people have about football is that um, quarterbacks, you know, mm-hmm. throw the. And I, by the way, I know very little about football, but I know a few things about physics. So uh-huh. thus, I am entitled to talk about football. Well, that's that was the <laughs> genesis of this conversation because when we first started, I said we have to talk about. Uh, how to, well, how physics plays into the throwing of a perfect spiral. And you said, no, we'll wait uh, for a Super Bowl coming yeah. up, which is coming up Sunday. So what are the physics of throwing the perfect spiral? Right. So people think, oh, you know, people, uh, you know, quarterbacks throw spirals so that the ball will go farther. And that couldn't be farther from the truth, in <laughs> fact. Right. I mean, imagine, uh, you know, filling up your get your car with gas and you have a full tank of gas that's the amount of energy you have in the car and if you want the car to go as far away possible from where you are you want to use as much energy produced by your tank of gas as possible to propel the car forward that's what you want the car to do you don't want to waste any energy making the car spin about its axis like a football does right so when the quarterback throws the football as hard as as he uh, can, the spiraling takes energy away, in fact, from the forward motion of the ball. So there's less energy available for the translation of the ball. So in fact, just on pure conservation of energy, you would argue you should not make the ball spiral. But have you ever tried throwing? I, I'm a horrible at throwing a ball, actually. Like, I've tried many, many times. It's really embarrassing. And I throw it, and it just does not go where I want it to go, number one. Number two, it never spirals. And number three, it typically doesn't go very far. <laughs> but does the spiral of the football reduce enough drag on the football so you gain a little further distance? Aha! Uh-huh, there you go. It's air resistance, <laughs> dummy. Of course, what I said was perf- would be perfectly true. You would never spiral a ball if you wanted to get really far away from you, if you want to, like, uh, throw a very long pass. If you were playing football on the moon, where there's, like, no air, mm-hmm. so you don't have to worry about air resistance, about drag. But on Earth, we have to worry about such things. And if a ball tumbles then there's a lot of drag. There's a lot of air resistance because it turns out air resistance is a force that opposes motion. It prevents you, to, you know, from, from moving forward, if you want. And it's proportional to the surface area in contact with the air, how much air is really hitting the object, if you want. And if the ball's tumbling, it will deflect the ball and it will prevent it from moving forward. Absolutely. Whereas if you throw a ball in a spiral, there's a very small amount of surface area relative to when it's tumbling that that air resistant can get its hands on to prevent the ball from moving forward. So indeed, on Earth, a spiral goes farther than a tumbler, if you want. Uh, But... Yeah, but kicks go further because leg muscles are bigger than arm muscles. And you can apply more force to a stationary object, the football on the tee, or a punt as you're holding the ball in your hand. And because your leg and you're applying more force to the football, it goes farther when you kick it than when you throw it. Well, right. I mean, if if my leg were as big as my arm, you know, I could bench press uh, (laughs) you and my wife and my kid all at once. It would be fantastic. But of course, leg muscles are much stronger because, well, they have to do a lot more work. Right for us, they have to keep us standing up and walking and running and doing all the things we do every day. Whereas if we were walking on our arms all the time, then they would build a lot of strength and then we would be able to throw uh, very hard uh, just as as we kick. But there's something else, though. Um, There's something else. I mean, when you kick the ball Mm -hmm. in football, 
typically you're not aiming at a receiver. Correct. <laughs> Whereas when you're throwing the ball, you really want the ball to go to go where you want the ball to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what spiral does, and that's really cool, it adds stability. It adds predictability. If I throw a ball in a spiral and I'm aiming at a receiver, if my spiral is good, the ball will continue to travel in the direction I threw the ball stably, mm -hmm. and then the receiver will be able to predict where to put his hands to catch the ball. That's not something you can do with a tumbler, right? Correct. And that has to do with angular momentum. What? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gyroscopes, yeah, <laughs> recession, it's lovely. It's a lot of really complicated physics, but, you know, long story short, it just helps the nose of the ball to stay mm -hmm. on target. Gravity is always trying to push the nose of the ball down, you know, because gravity does that. But, you know, air resistance and angular momentum uh, and torque push it back up so that the nose stays on target. It's 1450 KMMS, 1340 KPRK, discussing uh, the physics of football with MSU physicist and Nico Humes. Now, thinking about that, is the arc of a thrown football, because you generally throw it higher in the air to get where you're going, wanting it to go, and it descends, is that a small bit of an orbit? Well, we say that any trajectory is an orbit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so an orbit doesn't have to be closed. Absolutely. Any, any type of trajectory like that, even if it's very short, can be considered an orbit. And if you could throw the ball really, 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 really hard, then it would escape the atmosphere eventually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and because outside the atmosphere, well, there's, very, there's a vacuum in principle, there's very little air, there's no resistance that the ball exerts as it's leaving the atmosphere. And so it, it, it has to leave the atmosphere, so there's going to be air resistance. But then once, as it's climbing up and up and up and up, there's less and less of an atmosphere, so there's less and less of air resistance. So it's easier for the ball to continue moving until eventually it escapes. And there's no more atmosphere. And the force of gravity is weaker now because the ball has left Earth and the ball can, in principle, continue traveling. Of course, to do this, you would have to launch the ball at a ridiculous speed that's way beyond what, you know, humans can do. Um, but actually, that's also why... Did you know that this is why um, the shuttle and, like, the spacecrafts heat up on re-entry? Well, we, uh, air resistance, as it comes through the atmosphere, the resistance of the atmosphere heats the friction. Exactly, it's friction. So when it's leaving... There's no no issue because you're going from a region Earth where there's a lot of an atm a lot of air to a region where there's very little air. But when you're re-entering, you go from a region that has very little air to a region that has a lot of air. So it's similar to like, you know, jumping into a pool that would be like re-entry mm -hmm. uh, versus jumping out of a pool, which would be like exiting. My final question on the spiral of a football: Is yeah. there a you know, can you calculate? the appropriate velocity to achieve the perfect spiral. <laughs> <laughs> because well, you, the footballs are all standard sizes in the NFL. Yes. And if you th know the, the dimensions of that and you know the rate that you want it to spin by practice and practice and practice, there has to be an appropriate velocity or force to apply to that football to get it to spin perfectly. Yeah, so, so you want... It turns out that it depends on what you want to achieve, mm -hmm. of course. If you want to throw a very long pass, then you want the angle at which you throw the ball to be about 45 degrees. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two is you want to give it a spin so that the ball not only spins perfectly on its axis, but it also wobbles. It turns out this wobbling motion... Um, it's natural of this gyroscopic precession that I was referring to earlier, mm -hmm. and it adds stability. So it allows the ball to continue moving the direction you threw it for longer. And so the velocity, I think it's something like seven wobbles uh, per minute or so. Uh, and I have not calculated that, <laughs> but other people have. And it's absolutely something you can compute. You can calculate what's the... Of course, you're limited not only by what's the maximum... Well, what's the best velocity to, to speed it at, but also by, you know, how fast can you actually spin it at? Uh, you're, con you're limited by the strength of your fingers, I suppose, as you are throwing the ball. What about impacts? Tackling a running back. 
Because you, when you walked into the studio, you said if you have a big uh, linebacker on the defense and a small running back, and they, the, the defenseman is going to tack them, who actually has more, uh, what was it, velocity? Uh, force. Force. Who exerts the bigger force? So, so I was thinking, like, okay, so, I, you know, growing up, I was, mm-hmm. I was the chubby kid. Uh, in school, like, you know, when I was six or seven in Argentina. In Argentina, everyone plays soccer, pretty much. So on breaks, we would go play soccer, and the chubby kid goes to the goal, because that's what chubby kids do. So I was the goalie for the longest time. And then I sort of liked it, um, and I became the goalie all, all through high school for my for my high school. And I noticed um, that sometimes goalies, when they go up to catch the ball, they get run over. <laughs> <laughs> by strikers and then we flip in the air and it's very painful and and so when you have a collision like that it also happens in football right mm-hmm. so say the quarterback is about to throw the ball and he's like really not moving and then here comes a defender and tackles him right mm-hmm. or uh, the quarterback throws the ball and then there's a receiver then let's assume the receiver is not moving because he's mm-hmm. in the perfect position to catch the ball and here comes the defender and runs him over, right? And, and then the question is, in situations like this, um, who, who exerts more force, the, the quarterback or the uh, defender? I would, the defender, because they're moving like a freight train, either at the receiver or at the quarterback. I mean, I'm horribly wrong, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should take a commercial break and let the audience think about this, and then I'll give you the answer after the break. It's 1450 KMMS, 1340 KPRK. My name is Chris Griffin. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. In studio, Nico Jones discussing uh, the, the physics of football with me today. Uh, we left off with a large linebacker uh, or cornerback about to tackle a small receiver or uh, a quarterback itself. And who exerts more force? And the answer is, drum roll. <laughs> 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 they exert the same force. <laughs> quah, quah. I know. It's a lame answer, but that's what Newton tells us. F- equal, you know, forces, uh, by, or every action, if you want, exerts an equal and opposite reaction. It's one of Newton's laws. It's called the third law. I will not pronounce it in Latin for you because I do not know how to say that in Latin. <laughs> but it's true. The defender actually exerts the same force as the receiver or the quarterback. So, of course, the defender is exerting it on the quarterback and the quarterback is exerting it on the receiver, which is why the receiver actually also feels pain when he's tackling uh, the quarterback or the, or the receiver. And these very ideas are used in construction of helmets. Well, yeah, because just because they exert equal forces, it doesn't mean that they get equally injured. <laughs> <laughs> because something really fascinating comes about when you have a collision like this. Uh, there are really no uh, external forces here. So Newton also tells us that something called momentum has to remain constant right before and right after the collision. So what's momentum? Momentum is the mass of the object mm-hmm. times the velocity of the object. And it turns out that uh, the defenders are typically much heavier <laughs> than the quarterback or the receivers, right? Mm-hmm. They have to be. So before the collision, the defender is running at its maximum velocity with a lot of mass, a very heavy dude, right? Mm-hmm. And so he has a lot of momentum. After the collision, essentially all of that momentum has to be acquired very fast by the receiver, or, or the quarterback, the person that's receiving the collision. And, and the quarterback or the receiver, they can't just like magi- magically acquire mass and say like, ah, I'm going to get really massive so I don't have to move very fast after the collision. No, I mean, they're constrained to their weight. Mm-hmm. So, so they have to acquire a velocity that's actually larger than the velocity with which the defender has hit them. Okay, Mm -hmm. And that change of velocity going from zero to not zero, something actually quite large, induces an acceleration. Okay, Acceleration is just the change in velocity divided by the amount of time that uh, that it took for the collision to occur. And it's acceleration that causes the injuries. Because acceleration is what causes your internal organs Mm -hmm. to slosh around in your body. Okay, and hit against your bones and, and your brain to hit against your skull, which is what then causes a concussion. So you can't really prevent the momentum from changing. Newton tells you that that's going to have to be the case. So there's two ways. Well, there's one easy way in which you can 
uh, diminish the acceleration and, in, and increase the likelihood that the injury will be smaller, right? Is by increasing the amount of time during which the collision, the collision occurs. Make the collision take longer. Mm -hmm. How do you make the collision take longer? You add padding, right? Right. Because padding, if you have padding, when the defender collides with you, he first has to compress the padding before he hits your body, right? right? And that makes the collision take longer, which then makes the acceleration be smaller, which then makes the sloshing of the internal organs less severe, which then leads to less uh, concussions and things like that. It's 1450 KMMS, 1340 KPRK, MSU physicist Nico Yunz in the studio. As you were explaining that, Nico, so there is physics in the timing of an airbag in a vehicle. Absolutely. Because you have to account for, you know the mass of the vehicle, and if it goes from 60 to zero in a split second, that timing for the airbag to deploy and prevent your from, face from going into the, dry, the steering wheel is all physics. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you are inside of your of your vehicle and you're mm -hmm. traveling. Um, so vehicle plus you are traveling at 60 miles per hour before the collision. Mm -hmm. And after the collision, vehicle's not traveling anymore. But you are. But you are. <laughs> <laughs> you're now all of a sudden traveling at 60 miles an hour and you need to deaccelerate. So in order to suffer less of an injury, you want to decrease the amount of deacceleration that you're going to suffer. So you want to make the collision take as long as possible. And one way to do that is to put a lot of padding between you and the thing that's going to make you stop, which is typically the steering wheel or the windshield, right? <laughs> uh, and, and so you inflate these this, this airbags that act as a source of padding to increase the duration of the collision, therefore decrease the acceleration, therefore decrease the chance of injury. One more sidebar question, because I can't help but ask this one, because I'm, I'm thinking well, as you're talking to me, I am paying attention to you. <laughs> if, we're, if we're traveling in that vehicle again, and the car hits something and it stops, but you're still traveling, why is it when I jump straight up into the air, I land in the same place and I don't, the earth doesn't rotate underneath me and I'm halfway on the other side of the room? <laughs> because you're rotating with the earth. <laughs> same reason as uh, if you're on a boat. Have you ever been on a ship? On yes. A, on, a, on a sailboat or on a cruise ship? Uh, no, I've, I've, well, I've been on both. Do you get sick on, on, on sailboats? I get terribly sick. On I, I do not. Yeah, so a friend of mine and my wife went on, we went to LA, so I was giving a talk at Caltech, and on a Saturday, I was like, oh, you know, I've been training to like, uh, you know, what do you call it, drive a sailboat? I don't know. Pilot. Uh, pilot a sailboat. Uh, so let's go on a sailboat. I was like, sure, I guess. Hey, Jessica, how long do you know this Tim guy for? <laughs> like, he's not going to kill us, right? It's like, no, 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 he, he'll be okay. So, so off we go on the sailboat, and um, I started turning green violently green mm -hmm. it's called seasickness uh, it is called seasickness and the thing was going up and down you know because of the waves uh, you know it wasn't very rocky and whatnot and i could notice like our lunches they were moving up and down up and down but interestingly enough they were not shifting in position relative to us because us and our lunches where well, we're all traveling in the sailboat at the same velocity as the sailboat so from our point of view inside of the sailboat we weren't actually moving we are only moving from the point of view of somebody that was watching us from outside of the sailboat. Of course, the sailboat and us, the system was moving. And uh, I did not try jumping on the sailboat, but I guarantee you that had I jumped, I would have landed in exactly the same place <laughs> <laughs> I lifted off from. Um, I don't remember if I puked that one time, but it was a horrible experience. <laughs> 1450 KMS, 1340 KPRK. So what else do we need to know about the physics of football, Nico? <laughs> well, I don't know. What else do you want to ask well, me about football? Well, the, yeah, uh, well the, I mean, can, can physics benefit a coach? Absolutely. So I think uh, these things have been studied for a very long time. So everyone knows, um, everyone that's a professional in football knows about these basic physics principles. A quarterback knows that if he wants to throw really, really far away, he needs to throw at roughly 45 degrees. You know, mm -hmm. a, a um, defender, um, or sorry, a, a running back, right, that's trying to get as far away uh, with the ball as possible, he knows that to... Uh, suffer the least injury possible, he should run through the tackle. Why should he run through the tackle? Because 
it's the same thing we described earlier with momentum. Momentum has to be conserved. And it's much better for you if after the collision and before the collision, your momentum is not zero so that it has to change very little. If your momentum is changing very little, the acceleration you're going to suffer is smaller than it would otherwise. How do you define m momentum as you've used it throughout this conversation? Well, so I've been mm. saying it's the mass times the velocity okay. of the object. So the mass uh, of of the running bike is not going to change before or after the collision. So the so if you if you try to make your velocity change the, as little as possible, then that's going to induce uh, less of a of an acceleration, and actually it's going to also let you as a side mark. Uh, side remark, uh, break the toggle, right. which is probably what you want to do in the first place. <laughs> I mean, I know collisions are important and, and, and you know, injuries, you all, we all try to avoid those, but ultimately, you want to score. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out if you're moving before and after, uh, your chances of breaking that tackle are much, much higher. And people figure these things out, by the way, mm -hmm. before physicists came and said, oh, this is why this happens. Had they listened to us earlier, they would have figured these techniques out much earlier, too. <laughs> Before I let you go, because we're just about out of time, Nico, um, how are things with the Gravity Foundation? Um, the Extreme Gravity. The Extreme Gravity Institute. <laughs> 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 yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So uh, we are uh, slowly uh, taking off. We are putting all the pieces uh, in place, and we are soon going to begin a, a fundraising mm -hmm. uh uh, period to to really be able to uh, get all the activities going. We want to have uh, invited fellows from different prestigious universities around the world to come and visit and stay in Montana, in Bozeman for two months or so at a time. We want to have a public speaker series where we bring people like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Jana Levin uh, and Lawrence Krauss to come and talk to the general public on what physics is and why it's important and what extreme gravity is. We also want to host uh, workshops, scientific workshops and summer schools um, so that we can bring grad students from other places in the United States to learn about extreme gravity so that we can be the mecca, if you want, of, of extreme gravity in the United States. And we want to continue doing all of these outreach activities. So I think we're actually going to inaugurate officially the Institute, although this is not for sure, so don't tell anyone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no one's listening anyway. <laughs> That's right. It's like, what, 8 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> Um, in September okay. of, of this year. So we're actually putting a planetarium show together. <laughs> it should be very interesting. And so the premiere of the planetarium, uh, we're thinking about making that coincide with the inauguration of the Institute. So you, uh, if, if, we, if we pull it off, you'll definitely hear more about it uh, as, as time goes by and it'll be open to the public and so on. That's, uh, that's all great news. And the most exciting thing is that you're not going to be building one of those giant collider things and create a black hole here in Bozeman and swallow all the, the planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> how cool would that be? <laughs> Did I tell you the story of how um, one time... Uh, so, you know, we have this Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland yeah, trying to detect... Uh, yeah, CERN. Mm -hmm. Uh, trying to detect, or actually detected already, the Higgs particle that mm -hmm. endows all other particles with mass. The God particle. <laughs> Incorrectly called the God particle, but whatever. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, the God field, if you want. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, so so CERN, uh, the NHC got sued. <laughs> they, By, for what? I'm not... Uh, so they got sued for putting humanity in danger because there was a group of people that honestly believed that collisions at CERN could produce a black hole and that black hole could grow and then it could swallow the Earth. And there's a nugget of truth there that there was a chance that if extra dimensions exist, if they're large enough, if string theory is correct and some properties of string theory are right, then super tiny microscopic black holes could be generated in these collisions that would then, well, that's the part, that, that, that's the part that's true. Mm -hmm. The part they missed is that after they would be generated, they would evaporate almost instantaneously because they're so tiny that they could not remain stable. They would disappear due to something called Hawking radiation. Uh, but they forgot to read that part of the paper, I guess. They just got stuck on, you know, oh, the black hole was going to form. And then they thought, well, black holes suck things. So surely this microscopic black hole is just going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow and then eat Switzerland. And then surely after it, 
the United States, and so we should sue them and prevent them prevent them from <laughs> from <laughs> from from doing this experiment. And I don't I I don't know I don't want to. I'm not sure if these were American people that were suing, but I know that it was an international litigation that mm -hmm. went to um, an international court. Uh, what's that international court? Oh, um, uh, the, uh, at The Hague. At The Hague, yeah. yeah. It went to The Hague, and, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and a judge had to, like, actual scientists had to go and testify and, and, and convince the judge that that was not going to happen. And in fact, the judge, I think, killed the whole procedure early on, saying, you know... People from one country cannot prevent people from another country doing from doing an experiment. That's just ridiculous, right? And especially an experiment that is not going to destroy the Earth. So, so no, we're not going to build a particle accelerator that's going to create black holes that are going to destroy the Earth because that's not possible. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nico, you know I always enjoy this conversation. So, thank you for your time today, and uh, we'll catch up with you next week. Absolutely, thank you so much, Chris.